So welcome everybody, uh, people in the room and people uh, uh, via Zoom. So I, I'm glad to introduce um, Thomas Schaeffer for uh, today's uh, Fermat seminar. So I will just give a, a brief uh, 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 introduction um, who Thomas is at least uh, scientifically speaking. <laughs> so uh, Tom, uh, Thomas is uh, from, um, uh, from Austria and uh, he had his uh, bachelor and master at the TU Wien with uh, Alessandro Toschi. And then uh, uh, he did the PhD also at TU Wien also with Alessandro Toschi and uh, Karsten Held. Um, and he completed his PhD. I really like to read this one. Sub auspicis presidentis rei publice. <laughs> I find this uh, very <laughs> nice to say. Um, and then he moved to, um, uh, to France, to Paris, uh, for a postdoc uh, um, with uh, Antoine Georges. Um, uh, and then uh, more recently, uh, since a couple of years, he started his own research group uh, at the Max Planck Institute for uh, Solid State Research in Stuttgart. Uh, the group is called the Theory of Strongly Correlated Quantum Matter. So we slowly go uh, in the direction of today's talk that I still don't see there. Probably at some point something should appear there. Anyway, it was the talk uh, would be uh, the title is Multimethod, Multi-Messenger Approaches to Models of Strong Correlations. And uh, yeah, uh, I mean, you can guess the, uh, the topic. And uh, so we, we hope uh, to have a, a, a nice talk and at the beginning of a nice collaboration uh, between uh, uh, Fermat and, and Thomas. Stage is all yours. So thank you very much, Luca. I, I just wanted to uh, ask the people on Zoom whether uh, you can understand me with the, with the mic. Uh, maybe just give a... Small sign of. We can hear you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. There is good. a very good. A lot of uh, thumbs up, and uh, yeah, just just to say, so um, feel free to interrupt. Also, Thomas uh, told me that uh, uh, and, and ask questions, but please try to come uh, <laughs> at the, at the, uh, and use this one so that people at Zoom can also hear. I will monitor the chat in Zoom. In principle, you can also unmute yourself uh, and, and ask directly if you want, but uh, yeah, uh, up to you. Uh, and afterwards, for, for the Q&A, also I really ask people in the room to, to walk to the, to, the, to the microphone and, and, and ask. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much, Luca, again, for this uh, very kind introduction. And thank uh, you uh, and, and Claudia for this very nice invitation to come to, to Berlin and and have some nice discussions and hopefully a nice seminar. So yesterday I already was uh, quite impressed actually by all the efforts which are going on in Fermat. Uh, I was also impressed by the way by the amount of food in the Greek uh, restaurant. <laughs> it was very nice. So my mission today is to convince you that a certain perspective on strongly correlated electron systems, a so-called multi-method, multi-messenger approach, can be a very powerful technique to tackle uh, these complex systems and to get uh, very important insights into that. And this I want to exemplify with, uh, with three examples, namely to apply this approach to a simple test case, namely the Hubbard model on the square lattice without doping and without frustration. Then we go to more uncharted model territory, namely the Hubbard model on the triangular lattice at half filling. And at the end, uh, we will apply this approach also to uh, a direction of real materials. Um, but before we start, I just want to introduce uh, the people who are doing uh, the work in my group, uh, apart from me. So this is my postdoc, Marcel Klett, my two PhD students, uh, Mario and Mich uh, Michi, and my new master student here, Patrick Cheppe, and my secretary, Jeanette Schuler-Knapp. And as, uh, as Luca already introduced, uh, the topics in my group, uh, which we want to cover, are the theoretical description of unconventional superconductors and magnets, where, where we heavily rely on model systems, as you will see in a minute quantum criticality and also numerical method development. Um, but before we start, so to say, with the actual physics, uh, we have to find out wh why are correlations actually important and interesting. And this is an everyday example, so to say, the Mikado game. And uh, as you probably know, the Mikado game consists in uh, uh, picking up one of these Mikado sticks without uh, getting the others to move. So this game would be extremely boring if these Mikado sticks wouldn't interact with each other, or if they were simply ordered, right? And mathematically speaking, 
This, uh, this consists in uh, the expectation value of the product of two operators, simply factorizing in the product of two expectation values. If this is not the case, like in the true Mikado game, then we speak of correlations and of, obviously this uh, gets a bit of spice in, into, into the game. If we go now to solid states uh, systems, one of the check of the of, of all trades, so to say, of strongly correlated systems are the coup rates. And uh, I've brought you here a prototypical phase diagram of the coup rates uh, as a function of temperature and doping. And what you see here is there's a plethora of different phases appearing. So there's anti-ferromagnetic ordering, there's a pseudo gap, there's a strange metallic uh, regime. There is even thermoliquidated overdoping. And of, of course, there is this unconventional superconductivity. So it, uh, it is, first of all, very interesting from a materials point of view. On the other hand, it is also interesting because very challenging from a theoretical point of view to get a grasp on this phase diagram. Why does it look like this? What is the physical mechanism for all these phases? Or in our language, how can we model such a complex phase diagram? And one route to go, obviously, is an ab initio approach where you want to treat the whole Hamiltonian. A different route to go, and uh, this will be the base of my talk, is to introduce model systems, which are fairly easy to write down, but capture all the essentials of the physics, which uh, uh, which are assumed to be uh, to be the key players. And arguably the simplest model in electronic correlations is the so-called Hubbard model. Why is it so simple? Because it just consists of two terms uh, in its Hamiltonian. One is a term which enables electrons to hop, so to tunnel from one lattice side to another in a crystal. And the other one is actually a very crude approximation and modeling of the Coulomb interaction, which just says that uh, the Coulomb interaction is only active if two electrons are on the same lattice site. And due to the Pauli principle, they must have uh, one, one must have spin up and one must have spin down. Uh, so this model is very easy to write down. However, it turns out that it's tremendously hard to solve. And the uh, exact solutions of this model only exists in one and infinite dimensions. I will come to the infinite dimensional solution in, in a moment. Uh, but obviously, the most interesting situations are two and three dimensions for our materials. But in the, in the last uh, um, three decades or so, there have been tremendous progress in a numerical or computational uh, attack of this model, so to say. Um, and, uh, and we found out a lot of things uh, about this model. Uh, but how can we now attack this model in a numerical perspective? Well, there are uh, broadly defined four classes of different algorithms uh, where you can obtain uh, finer temperature properties and excitation spectra of the Hubbard model. Uh, so one class of these uh, approaches are so-called numerically exact techniques. Uh, like uh, lattice quantum Monte Carlo or diagrammatic Monte Carlo. If they can be applied, and if they converge, and I will define afterwards what convergence actually means here, uh, they lead to the exact numerical solution of the problem. Unfortunately, obviously, these methods cannot be applied everywhere in the phase diagram of this important model. So uh, we have to rely also on approximations. And the, the simplest approximation, as you know, as a, as a theoretical physicist, is a mean field approximation, for example, random phase approximation, which neglects both temporal and spatial correlations in your system. If you want to go one step uh, further, we can introduce temporal correlations by means of the so-called dynamical mean field theory. Uh, we'll talk about this in a minute. Uh, but if we want even to, uh, to uh, go beyond uh, just the simple temporal correlations, for example, in the vicinity of second order phase transitions, we have to extend our DMFT framework. This can be done in two different ways uh, with cluster extensions and diagrammatic extensions will be also introduced afterwards. And uh, the, uh, the fourth class, which I want to introduce you of methods, are other common many-body techniques like the TPSC or functional renormalization group, etc. So you see there's a whole zoo of different methods available nowadays to tackle the properties of strongly correlated systems and the Hubbard model especially. Uh, and we thought uh, that we should put these methods to the test. Let me define a very simple test bed where all of these methods can be applied, compare them, and make also the data in the actually a poor man's uh, way of, of Fermat spirit uh, available, namely uh, text files. But uh, we, we, can, we can discuss this afterwards, how this could be improved. Uh, so we gathered experts in each and every one of those methods, and, uh, um, and uh, we applied the methods to this test bed. So the test bed consists in the two-dimensional uh, square lattice uh, Hubbard model, half-field case, at a fairly small value of the interaction, namely two times uh, the tunneling amplitude, the hopping, 
And we calculated observables as a function of T, one particle observables like coherence temperature, pseudo gap temperature, uh, also energies like the W occupancy, but also two particle observables like the fully momentum dependence of stability and magnetic correlation lengths. So let me guide you first through uh, physically a bit through the phase diagram of this model without applying now a specific technique. So this model in the case of half filling and uh, uh, without frustration, uh, looks like this. You have a temperature axis here, you have an interaction axis here. And uh, at t equals to zero, we have an antiferromagnetic ordering. So finite temperature uh, ordering is prohibited by the Merman Wagner theorem uh, here in, in two dimensions. So at finite temperature, we don't get any ordering. However, we get a very intriguing uh, sequence of different physical crossovers in this regime. So if we start at very high temperature, uh, we get the so-called incoherent regime of not yet formed quasi-particles. So we have independent atoms, basically. And uh, this translates in, in, into uh, a, a specific shape of the so-called self-energy, which encapsulates all the electronic correlations on the Matsubara, so on, uh, on the imaginary frequency axis, uh, such that it diverges at low frequencies, and there is no momentum differentiation here. So we introduced the two uh, momenta, namely the antinode pi zero and the node uh, pi half pi half. And you see the self energy quantity has the same shape for both momenta, plus it diverges at low frequencies. If we now progressively cool down the system, we see the following. At the node, uh, we, uh, uh, we see that uh, the, the, uh, the value of this quantity gets reduced. And you could think of a Taylor expansion at low frequencies already uh, for this quantity. And this means translated in a spectral function way that we get coherence in certain momentum directions. If we now cool further the system, it turns out that we get coherence at every point of the Fermi of the yet formed uh, now formed Fermi surface, uh, which means that we get a metallic regime. Not necessarily a Fermi liquid, but a metallic regime. But if we cool the system further down, uh, the spin fluctuations, uh, which I will uh, show in a minute. Uh, uh, which uh, are stemming from the uh, ordered ground state kick in, and they are responsible for gapping out uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the quasi particles first at the antinode and at the, then at the node. So in this regime four and five, we get what, what we call the so-called weak coupling uh, pseudo gap. So the question now is, this is the physics, which is more or less intuitive, I would say. Um, how can we treat this numerically? So let's start uh, with numerically exact techniques like this lattice quantum Monte Carlo. And this consists in simulating finite size systems in a quantum uh, Monte Carlo way, and then try to extrapolate to the thermodynamic limit. So I take a small cluster, a larger cluster, and so on. I calculate my quantities, and then I try uh, this, uh, this uh, extrapolation. The second numerical exact technique which we used here is uh, a bit of a, of, a, of a new kit on the block, namely diagrammatic Monte Carlo. And this consists in, uh, in sampling high order Feynman diagrams in the perturbative series, but to very high orders in order to be able to uh, resum the series, so converge it uh, and then obtain uh, a numerical exact uh, result here. So what can these techniques do for us? So first of all, uh, I've, I've plotted you here uh, this uh, the self energy quantity at the anti node in the first row and at the node in the second row for these two techniques. First of all, you see that all these five regimes, which we uh, heuristically, so to say, uh, discussed before, appear also in the numerical techniques. This is very nice. And the second thing is that both uh, numerical exact techniques agree. And just, just as a side remark, this was not the case when we started the project. <laughs> so this project also led to the consequences that uh, people corrected and uh, each other in, in a certain sense, because, um, you know, you have sometimes you have uh, you have knobs of, at, in this in this techniques to tune uh, so that you get uh, really precise uh, measurements. And now we got two completely different techniques to agree, which is uh, by itself uh, already quite something. So lucky we, the exact methods uh, capture the physics and they agree. So what about the approximative methods? And uh, as I said before, uh, the easiest uh, method which you can do as a physicist is a mean field approximation, a mean field theory. And in a certain sense, this consists in taking our many body Hamiltonian and create the mean field in space, which corresponds actually to taking the co so-called coordination number 
to infinity or the dimensionality of the system to infinity. This results in a self-energy, which is just a number, so it's neither frequency nor momentum dependent. The MFT, so the dynamic, dynamical mean field theory, goes now one step beyond, and it just creates a mean field in space, but keeps all the fluctuations in time. And this is achieved by mapping this uh, uh, many-body Hamiltonian, so the Hubbard uh, Hamiltonian, onto a single site Anderson impurity model. And you can see that the occupation of this uh, single site Anderson impurity can change in time. So there can be zero occupation, one electron spin up or spin down, or a double occupation. So our self-energy, which encapsulates all the correlations, is frequency dependent, but not yet momentum dependent. So what can this technique do for us? Well, let's take a look again at the phase diagram and now in the DMFT way. So for, forget for a moment this, this orange line, which is the mean field theory. In the DMFT, you see that instead of five different regimes, we have three here. But this is logical because the regime two and four are defined by momentum differentiation of the self-energy, which we do not capture in DMFT. The second thing is DMFT is in space still a mean field theory which means it does not respect the moment wagner theorem. So we get actually an ordered phase, which is a, obviously a spuriously ordered phase because in two dimension, we should not have order. However, the nice thing about this is that uh, it already indicates from the DMFT perspective that antiferromagnetic fluctuations are very, very uh, crucial to describe the physics here. Also, DMFT knows its own breakdown because if we calculate the correlation length, I will come to this uh, later on in the talk as a function of the inverse temperature here. Um, first of all, the DMFT is, is following the, the, which is shown in gray here, is following the benchmark in black. Uh, and then at some point, obviously diverges because this indicates that an, an ordered phase is appearing here. But this tells you also that uh, you should be a bit careful in this regime to trust the DMFT result. However, uh, one also has to say that if you take DMFT seriously, which I mean that you not only restrict yourself to the paramagnetic solution, but go into the ordered phase, the DMFT can be a very, very good approximation within this phase, because if you compare, for example, the spectral weight, uh, as defined of the imaginary part of the Green's function here as a function of temperature with the, with the benchmark, you see that you have a very, very similar shape uh, compared to this benchmark, namely that if you cool down the system, your quasiparticles get more and more and more coherent, which means that the spectral weight is, uh, is increasing. And then if you hit the ordered phase in DMFT, this uh, spectral weight goes down as in the benchmark. It goes down uh, um, uh, due to two different mechanisms, namely in the, in the benchmark calculations, these long range spin fluctuations kick in, whereas in the DMFT, you get an ordered state. But the, so to say, the, con the, 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 um, uh, the, the consequence stays, uh, stays in a certain sense the same. So DMFT is actually a very good starting point. But how now, how to include correlations beyond the MFT, namely spatial correlations? And for this, we take a look first at how these correlations behave by taking a look at magnetic susceptibilities and magnetic correlation lengths. So what we have to do is uh, to calculate uh, the fully momentum dependent and uh, frequency dependent response function uh, for the spin, which we can do in, in many of those, uh, of those techniques. So let's take a look at, at this value uh, at this quantity as a function of the inverse temperature. So what you see here is that in the mean field theory, obviously this quantity diverges as in the DMFT because also mean field theory has an ordered state at low temperatures. You see here these two uh, benchmark methods, uh, see that is diagrammatic Monte Carlo and DQMC is the lattice quantum Monte Carlo. Again, they agree, but you also see uh, that there is a certain barrier here at the very low temperature where this uh, methods cannot resolve anymore this very long uh, correlation length and the breakdown. Uh, in the DMFT, as I said before, we get an ordered phase, which means that we also have a divergence uh, of this quantity here because the correlations uh, are getting very, very large. Now, can we include these spatial correlations on top of DMFT within the DMFT framework? The answer is yes, and there are two uh, distinctive uh, paths uh, to do this. One are so-called cluster extensions of DMFT. And I told you before that DMFT consists in the mapping of a many-body Hamiltonian onto a single site Anderson impurity model. So a natural extension of this is obviously to uh, map the many-body Hamiltonian onto a cluster uh, of, a, of a finite size. So for example, a two by two cluster. This can be done uh, in, in, in real space, which is then called cellular DMFT or CDMFT. 
or in momentum space where you create momentum patches of constant self-energy, which is called dynamical cluster approximation or DCA. But of course, uh, these methods are restricted in a certain sense that they only can resolve non-local correlations up to the size of the cluster, naturally. Um, we applied uh, CDMFT in a very, very modern uh, fashion. And uh, I mean, this is more or less top-notch because these are 64 lattice sites in the CDMFT, which is possible here because we are tough filling, so the sum problem can be mitigated. Uh, nevertheless, it's, it's very impressive. And what you see here in, in, in the uh, as a difference to the DMFT, that at intermediate temperatures, the susceptibility uh, is, is on top now of the benchmark, but then also at lower temperatures, obviously, also CDMFT shows the ordered phase because our correlations are growing and growing uh, when lowering the temperatures. So we, at some point, they are exceeding the cluster size, and then we get, uh, we get ordering. So can we do, in a certain sense, better here? And... Uh, for long-range uh, correlations, there exists a different branch of extensions of DMFT, which are probably better suited, namely diagrammatic extensions of DMFT. And uh, I will show you not, uh, because there is a whole zoo also of diagrammatic extensions of DMFT here, I will focus on the so-called dynamical vertex approximation or DGMA, and just give you a grasp of what this method actually consists of and then show you some results. So for this, obviously, for diagrammatic extensions, we have to go uh, to Feynman diagrams. And uh, for our uh, Hubbard uh, Hamiltonian, there are two ingredients for Feynman diagrams, which are the free propagation of a quasi-particle with momentum K, which is called the free Green's function, and the local interaction U. Uh, we cannot build up uh, diagrams at the so-called one particle level, where we shoot in one particle, let it interact with the system and take it out again. So this is what is usually called the Green function. And the basic building block of such uh, a, a one particle level green function is our beloved self energy, so the so called irreducible uh, part of this. One can visualize this with the so called Dyson equation. So if I shoot in a particle in the system, it can simply propagate through the system. It can interact with the system once, twice, and so on. And if I resum this series, which is a geometric series, I get the so called Dyson equation, where I can calculate my interacting green function. I can also now build up these diagrams at the two particle level. So I shoot in two particles, let them interact with the system and take it out again. And the two particle analog of the self energy is the so-called vertex. And uh, this, uh, the, the equation translates into the so-called beta salpeta equation. So I have two particles here, non-interacting with the system, interacting once via this vertex gamma, uh, hence the name, the name D gamma A. Uh, once, twice, and so on. I can resum this and I end up at the so-called beta salpeter equation. Now comes the part where I link it to the DMFT. Uh, the DMFT approximation, you can view as taking the self-energy, which is the one particle irreducible vertex, so to say, to be purely local, as I said before, because you have a self-energy which is only frequency dependent. If now, if you now raise this assumption to the two particle level, you you end up at the D gamma A and the corresponding uh, quantity, the ir corresponding irreducible quantity at the two particle level, namely the two particle fully irreducible vertex, is then assumed to be purely local. If you now go with this assumption through your equations, it turns out that the self energy itself is not purely local anymore, but acquires a certain systematic uh, K dependence, momentum dependence. Uh, the details on the algorithm we, dis we can discuss afterwards. Uh, but this is just to, to get you a grasp uh, of this diagrammatic extension, which build on the fact that you can extract, so to say, a higher order correlation function from an Anderson impurity model. Now, what can this DGMA do for us? Well, if you see here, this is the DGMA calculation now in blue. Uh, first of all, it, it, it's, uh, it's performing uh, quite well in the metallic regime, but in the DGMA, we can also go to very, very low temperatures. And uh, this is now a log plot. And you, what you can see here is that uh, the correlations, uh, if you take it as a measure of correlations, the susceptibility grow exponentially in the, uh, in the uh, low temperature regime. Also, the D gamma A in this version uh, respects the Merman Wagner theorem. So it does not show ordering at, uh, at finer temperatures. Last question here, how extended are the spin fluctuations? And this is a question regarding the so-called correlation length. We can calculate this correlation length uh, because we have available uh, the full momentum dependent uh, uh, susceptibility 
And uh, we have a, a, a model a fit function, so to say, which is the so-called ornstein zernike form of this uh, correlator, which is simply a, a constant divided by Q minus the ordering vector, which is pi pi in the anti-ferromagnetic case, plus the correlation length to the minus two, plus a frequency dependent part, which we neglect here because we're just focusing on the static one. This just tells you that if the ordering at the susceptibility gets more and more peaked, the correlation length gets, uh, uh, increases. And you can see this here as a function of the inverse temperature. So we have beta 4, 12.5 and 15 here. And if we cool down the system, you can see that the ordering, that the peak at the ordering vector of the susceptibility grows and grows and grows. This translates then to a correlation length, which also grows. And it, in fact, uh, as you can see in the D gamma here, it grows again exponentially at low temperatures. So now the circle closes, namely, uh, if this magnetic correlation length grows exponentially, uh, there is a certain point here where this correlation length always becomes larger uh, than the so-called thermal de Broglie wavelength of the quasiparticles. And this means that the quasiparticles get destroyed, they localize, and we get the so-called weak coupling pseudo gap. And this uh, criterion is the so-called uh, Wilk uh, criterion here. So we have the footprints of the spin fluctuations actually in all observables at the one at a two particle level. Last point here in this in this in this uh, in this first example, uh, it's a bit puzzling though, although we have this criterion that we have actually a metallic regime at intermediate temperatures, but a fairly large correlation length. So this is this is a bit counterintuitive. But this we can resolve, uh, namely we can connect this one and two particle level also in a semi-analytical way, namely in the so-called spin fluctuation theory. So what we can do here is a kind of GW, namely uh, we can calculate the sigma uh, by the convolution of the green function and the susceptibility. What it turned out is that uh, at fairly low temperatures, correlations only of the, of the Q vector pi pi are dominant. So they are controlling the physics. And if this is the case, you can, uh, you can uh, find out of the analytics that you get an insulating state. Whereas at fairly intermediate uh, temperatures, so beta 8, you can already see that many Q vectors are contributing because you have this ornstein zernike fit here uh, in, in green, I guess, and uh, this, uh, the Diga May data in blue, and you see that at the, at the edge, uh, uh, the, the, the fit is not that, that good anymore uh, as, uh, as at low temperatures. And there you can conclude that uh, you get the metallic self-energy because many other Q vectors are contributing. So this resolves somehow the, the dichotomy of the sizable correlation and the metallic state. So this is for the first application. Are there any questions already on this part for the square lattice Hubbard model? Okay. If this is not the case, then you can think about the questions maybe for in, the, in the other parts. Uh, second part here, uh, this, the, the first example was actually a quite well studied case already. However, we managed also in this, in this publication to get more insight into the physics of, of, of this actually well studied system. What is not so well studied is the Hubbard model on the triangular lattice. Um, and this is a very important thing because uh, this is considered as the minimal model for potential spin liquid candidates like this uh, Betts uh, crystals. Um, because you can introduce here via this, uh, already via the, the lattice geometry, both correlations and frustration, uh, geometric frustration in your system. Uh, recent um, IDMRG calculations, so these are ground state calculations, show that for this model at half filling, uh, you have at t equals to zero, a sequence of different states, namely at low coupling, a metallic, so a gapless uh, a phase, then you have a non-magnetic insulating phase, which is gapped, but non-magnetic. And then you have a 120 degree Heisenberg uh, spin ordered uh, gapped phase as a function of the interaction. And uh, this is, as I said, uh, these are ground state calculations, so uh, t equals to zero. But obviously the ground state, as we already saw before, has influence at finite temperature properties. Uh, the ground state properties are usually well described by uh, wave function based methods like DMRG or this uh, newly introduced METS method, 
Whereas uh, finite temperature properties is, uh, are usually the realm of green function or embedding methods like DMFT, as I showed before. So the question which uh, we ask ourselves is, uh, can we, with this multi-method, multi-messenger approach, marry, so to say, those, those worlds? Can we, can we shake hands from this uh, with of the green function-based methods with the wave function-based methods? So what we did is we took a subset of the methods which, uh, which I introduced uh, to you before. Uh, to apply it to this uh, to this model, uh, what we did is a diagrammatic Monte Carlo, where it could be actually uh, resummed. So this served as a benchmark, uh, but is limited in the U and and then temperature range. Uh, DMFT, we applied it both in the paramagnetically restricted and symmetry broken. So this 120 degree symmetry broken phase, uh, and a cluster extension of DMFT, namely cellular DMFT with seven sides. So these are the green function based methods, and on top of this, we applied a wave function based method, the so called minimally and angled thermal uh, typical states, the MET, MET method, on a finite size cylinder of 16 uh, times 4. So let's start again with, uh, with, with uh, the simplest uh, approximation, namely DMFT in our case. So for DMFT in finite temperatures, you see here a, a large uh, white region, and this white region is uh, the paramagnetic uh, state of the DMFT. But you also see that we have a reddish uh, shaded uh, uh, region here. And this is indicating this 120 degree Heisenberg ordering. If we now do a temperature cut at, at the fixed temperature, we can again compare uh, our methods for um, observables which are accessible to all of the methods. And one observable is the W occupancy or uh, potential energy. So let's, uh, let's uh, compare the potential energy at the fixed temperature here for all of those methods. And you see that until a U of six or so, all the methods basically agree. And then you get uh, deviations which stem from exactly this mean field nature, for example, of DMFT. However, this is also very interesting here because you see that two methods which are completely different. It's the METS and the CDMFT. They agree over the whole range of U values, namely, quite nicely. The same is, is more or less true uh, for, the, for the kinetic energy. So uh, if we are, if we are uh, generous with our error bars, uh, it, uh, the, these, uh, these uh, methods also agree here. But obviously, there are some errors introduced by different geometries of the cluster or of the, of the tube of the, of the METs. So this is already very nice. Um, let's take out these two methods, so CDMFT and METs. So, uh, a green function based method and a wave function based method and compare them a bit more. So uh, what is also clear from the ground state calculations that at some point there has to be some metal to insulator transition or crossover in the phase diagram. So can these methods uh, uh, predict this actually? Um, this was a bit more tricky because uh, not all the observables which are available in CDMFT are available in METS, for example. So we had, we had to come up uh, with, uh, with uh, two observables which describe this metal to insulator crossover in both of those techniques. In the CDMFT, this was the spectral weight, as I've shown you uh, already, already before for the DMFT. And I want, to focus, I want you to focus now on the beta 10 curve, because this is the same temperature as we took a look at before. Uh, so the spectral weight, as you can see, as a function of the interaction, uh, drops relatively sharply around the uh, U9 here. Uh, so we assume that DMFT, uh, CDMFT gives this metal to insulator crossover at around U9. In the METS method, uh, we have access to wave functions. So uh, what, what we can do here is to define uh, the so-called localization length, which is the average extension of a wave packet, basically. And what you can see here is that for different lengths of the cylinder in the METS, on the left-hand side of U9, uh, this localization length is, is growing when you, when you extend the cylinder, which means that your wave packet is delocalized. On the other hand, at higher interaction, there is not much change if you extend the cylinders, which means that the wave packet is localized, hence you have an insulating state. And the nice thing is that uh, CDMFT and METS quite nicely agree that this metal to insulator crossover at beta 10 uh, is taking place at around U9. The second question to be answered or to, to be addressed is uh, magnetism and chirality in the system. And this, I have to say, is, is a purely METS perspective um, uh, in, 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 uh, in, this, in this case. So these are results only from METS. 
From that, we could see the following. We can calculate the spin structure factor at the K prime point, which corresponds to this 120 degree Heisenberg ordering. Uh, so you, the spin structure factor, you can loosely say it's connected to the susceptibility, so the, to the ordering of the system. If you take a look at that, you see the following. If you cool down the system at around U12 or so, uh, this uh, this uh, spin structure factor starts to diverge. Hence, this is the leading instability when going to low temperatures at a fairly large interaction. Uh, you can also calculate the M point, which would correspond to spin stripe uh, uh, ordering. This is more dominant in the regime at intermediate coupling, so where the metal to insulator transition takes place at around U9 or 10, uh, but not anymore uh, so dominant at, 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 U, at U12. Furthermore, you can calculate the chiral chiral correlator. And it turns out that already in the intermediate coupling regime, you get this, this, uh, this uh, chiral correlation. So you can draw a tentative uh, uh, phase diagram, namely that from U10 or so, you get stripy spin states as well as chiral correlations, whereas uh, at U12 or so, you get these chiral correlations and uh, 120 degree Heisenberg ordering. Uh, so with this, I want to conclude the part which is uh, purely focused on on, uh, on models, and I want to thank obviously all my many collaborators. Uh, I had really fun in, in coordinating uh, the, uh, this 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 uh, study with 20, 26 uh, collaborators here. So, are there any questions for the triangular lattice Hubbard model or the square lattice Hubbard model at this point? Yes. I can also repeat the question. Yeah, which is chiral correlation. Yes, yeah, so it's time reversal symmetry breaking, basically. Okay. I have a question. Yes, Rosia. Hello, Thomas. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question. Hello. So um, <laughs> if I want to, you basically now for the triangular lattice, you basically compared um, CDD MFT with uh, METS. So if I want to now uh, know a little bit about the computational effort that you have in these two sets of calculations, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, so uh, I, I, can, I can tell you a bit more of the, on the CDMFT side, uh, because this was the calculation done on, on our side, so to say. Uh, it, is, it is really borderline. <laughs> so um, the problem is a bit that we analyzed the fully frustrated model so the uh, not with anisotropy, etc. And there, I would say that for, for having this, this, uh, this cut at beta, beta 10, uh, we, need, we needed more or less 1 million core hours for the seven side cluster. So this is about the computational okay. effort. So this was also a bit of the problem, so to say, why we did not extend it uh, fully the, uh, the, the study already to lower temperatures. Because obviously, uh, when lowering the temperature, you would uh, you would have to increase uh, your Monte Carlo sweeps also there. Because this would be would have been very interested interesting to determine whether you really have only a crossover or a real transition then uh, for the mod. Yeah, for the for the for the mats actually, I think we are about the same ballpark. Uh, at least what I what I what I know from uh, from Alex. So Alex Wittek was was the uh, the mastermind behind the mats part of this project. Um, I think they are they are quite comparable in the sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my yeah. second question is how difficult it is to go into the anisotropic triangle lattice. So you were motivating basically your studies with all these charge transfer salts, but there you know that they are yes. anisotropic. So how how difficult it is to go to a TT prime type of um, triangle lattice? So with the CDMFT, it's absolutely absolutely doable, and we are doing this at the moment. Okay. Uh, and it's even even better in a certain sense because you're getting closer. If you would think, you know, approximate this model with a what we call the fake triangular, namely a square lattice with only a diagonal hopping, yeah. uh, you're approaching more and more the square lattice, which means that you're approaching more and more the uh, this particle hole symmetric case. So this is really this this fully frustrated one is the the worst case uh, basically for the CDMFT. Maybe my last question before you continue. Um, right. In fact, my um, so if, when you in, in let's go to DMFT or cluster DMFT when you want to test your the magnetic order that you have. So, for instance, yeah. this one hundred and twenty degrees. So these non-collinear orders. How do you do that there? 
So then long, then uh, you mean uh, different of spiral or what? Or, yes, or... yes. So exactly. Yeah. So well, how do I mean, you test that? I mean, with the wave functions, it's easy. You showed the the basically the correlation functions that one is measuring. How do you do that in uh, DMFT yeah. or cluster DMFT? What, 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 what you can do there is, and this is relatively new, new enough for us, is uh, that you can make a rotation of the block sphere, actually. That you really apply a magnetic field in the, with the angle you, you want, so to say, and let the spin rotate. And this oh, actually works in the CDMFT. I see. Uh, okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions in the audience or via Zoom? So if not, then uh, let's uh, let's continue with uh, with the last part, namely to do, to go into a bit of a perspective of real materials, and uh, what we wanted to investigate here are uh, materials which are which are uh, a hot topic in in solid state physics, namely this uh, so called infinite layer nickelates, and the reason for this is that uh, now superconductivity has been found in some of those uh, materials. Plus, they also are synthesized uh, at the Max Planck uh, Institute in Stuttgart. So we wanted to take a look at the infinite uh, layer nickelate compound lanthanum nickel 2 And uh, the reason for this also partially is that if you take a, a, a look at, this, at the band structure, it turns out that you have one dominant band around the Fermi level, uh, which is the nickel uh, dx, minus, uh, dx square minus y square band plus an electron reservoir here. So we could think of modeling this as a, sing, as a simple, so to say, single band Hubbard model with uh, a certain interaction parameter and certain tight binding parameters. Uh, this modelization for the neptunium nickel oxide uh, has already been very successful in, uh, in describing uh, the superconducting dome uh, in, this, uh, uh, in, this, in this compound via the so-called dynamical vertex approximation uh, or D-gamma A. But in this project, we wanted to, uh, to take a look about uh, what can this single band Hubbard model tell us about the magnetism. And the motivation for this was that um, at the Max Planck Institute, uh, uh, they were the, the experimental group of, uh, of uh, 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 Matthias Hepting, uh, which is, uh, who is a group leader in the uh, department of Bernhard Keimer, investigated this uh, compound in various experimental fashions. So they had specific heat measurements, MUSR, but we are concentrating now on the squid uh, measurements here. And what, uh, what they did is measuring the magnetic susceptibility, so the uniform magnetic susceptibility with the squid, uh, as a function of the temperature. And this is what came out. So if you cool down the system in a certain temperature regime, the correlation function drops and then has a pickup again, which can be ascribed to ferromagnetic impurities. So we can forget, so to say, let's forget at, at the moment about this, uh, about the low temperature phase. And let's take a look at the intermediate temperature phase. And this tells you clearly that you have a non curie wise behavior in your system because you cool the system and the susceptibility uh, is reduced. Can we model this uh, with, uh, with some uh, sequences of approximations theoretically? Well, we obviously first started at uh, the stage of an isolated atom, which fulfills the Curie law. So this will not model uh, the, the drop of the susceptibility. Already an isolated 2 by 2 cluster actually leads by a singlet formation to a drop of the susceptibility, but this has a complete uh, different slope than uh, we saw from the experiment. So we wanted to go beyond this uh, 2 by 2 cluster. So first thing which we did obviously was DMFT for the single band Hubbard model. DMFT also orders here antiferromagnetically, but until the point where it orders antiferromagnetically, uh, this, uh, this, the, the, the DMFT susceptibility fulfills the Curie-wise uh, behavior. So we, want, we, we already have an indication that non-local correlations play a role here. This indication uh, grow, grew, uh, so to say, because we introduced then uh, non-local correlations via CDMFT calculation, which we saw before also orders at low temperatures. But you already get an indication here of a deviation of, uh, from the qe wise law. Then we applied the D gamma A, which I also showed you before. And there you see a clear trend that, uh, first of all, it follows uh, the CDMFT trend at intermediate temperatures. D gamma A respects the Merman Wagner theorem, which means that we're not ordering here. And we get a, a downturn of the susceptibility. So we could think of comparing this curve now to the experimental curve and actually. Uh, it's quite nice. 
However, there is a caveat, and you always should take care of uh, reading the legends properly, namely that we had to multiply our theoretical curves by a factor of 10. Uh, and this uh, this is not yet completely resolved. However, uh, the measurements here were done on on powder uh, samples, and they redid measurements on single crystals. And now we got a factor of three uh, in the difference. So you know the experiment is getting closer to to the calculation, which 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 I like. Um, the question which we can ask theoretically is here now: What about doping and the connection to the spectral function? So, what can we learn from the one-band Hubbard model about these quantities? Well, we can now dope the system uh, either, uh, uh, so to say, the uh, only only the band here uh, with uh, with uh, with holes, or this was corresponds to a certain strontium doping in the real material. What you see is that we get a nail temperature in uh, in CDMFT. Um, which is uh, which is uh, suppressed at higher doping levels, and this uh, nail temperature goes hand in hand with the so-called T star line of gamma A, and the T star line is defined as the maximum of the spin uh, susceptibility within gamma A as a function of the temperature for different dopings. If we now take a look at a certain cut, namely at 7.5 percent of doping here, and take a look at the spectral function within gamma A. What you see is a very interesting thing, uh, namely that uh, if you extract the spectral weight at the antinode and at the node for these two quantities, you see that the spectral weight at the node continues to grow when you lower the temperature. However, the antinode gets suppressed, and this is a clear sign of a pseudo gap, which is uh, which is opening in the system. I used the word pseudo gap already before in my talk, but I was talking about the weak coupling pseudo gap. So the question is here, do we have a weak coupling pseudo gap also here, which means that we have a large correlation length uh, needed to, to open the gap? And the answer is no, because we can again extract the uh, fully momentum dependent response function uh, from our calculations and uh, make an Ornstein Seneca fit and find out what is the correlation length. And it turns out that at uh, the, the point where the pseudo gap opens, the correlation length of the system is actually one point uh, something, 1.8 lattice sites, which is super small actually. So we conclude here that we got get a rather a short range uh, uh, spin correlations which open such a strong coupling pseudo gap. So with this, I also want to thank my, my collaborators on, on this project so from the experimental part. Um, uh, mainly uh, Matthias Hepting and Bernhard Keimer, and from uh, from the other theory, theory uh, my postdoc Marcel Klett and Philipp Hansmann of, of Erlangen. And I hope that I, today I could convince you with three examples that such a multi-method, multi-messenger approach to strongly correlated systems provides really fascinating insights, uh, at least on the model level, but also uh, on the real materials level. I just use 10 seconds for a shameless advertisement. So uh, from September on, uh, there is a, a postdoc opening in my group uh, in Stuttgart. Uh, and uh, I, I, I will advertise this more officially uh, in, in December. Uh, the deadline of the call would be uh, 31st of, of January. And you know, if you're interested you know, to learn a bit more about, about model systems and strong correlations, then I would be happy uh, that you join my group. And with this, I want to thank you again for this nice invitation and attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Um, yeah, Claudia. Uh, could you... Thank you very much for this nice presentation. I have a more general question. So you compare different methods and obviously uh, looking at the number of people who have contributed to this, this means not everything can be computed by one code. So to which extent can you exclude, uh, I don't know, deviations also coming from implementations and ap approximations or whatever is done there? Um, so I think one has to distinguish between uh, really, uh, as, as, as you said, uh, some sort of implementations. The, the, the point is, for, for those codes, we really connect it to the experts in the field, right? So these are, you know, if you don't want to implement all the codes yourself, uh, then you turn turn obviously to the experts, and it's, it's it's a very good point. Actually, in the in the project itself, it turned out that um, sometimes we really had self-correcting mechanisms in a certain sense because uh, sometimes we got results. So the people sent me so to say their results of, of the respective codes, 
And sometimes we thought, ah, oh, this, this cannot be correct. Yeah. And then it, it went back uh, to them and uh, they, they found actually some, uh, for example, that some momentum grids were not converged and, and so on. So you also see the practical um, uh, advantages of such, uh, you know, a multi method uh, collaboration also, not only in the physical output, but also in the, in the, in the, in the code self correcting mechanisms. So this is a fun, a very fascinating aspect of this, of this large collaboration, I have to say. Okay, I don't see questions from uh, Zoom. Um, I have a physic. Okay, closer. Yeah, okay, please go, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. If you have a question, you go ahead after after you. Uh, okay. Yeah. No, I've uh, well, almost physical question. Uh, what about <laughs> what about uh, going to three-dimensional uh, Hubble model? Uh, right. So, what right. is the extra complexity besides the obvious? It, that yeah. depends really pretty much on the method, actually. So, for example, if you think of CDMFT now for a cluster method, uh, this simply means that your correlations cannot be that that large anymore because you have to add a third dimension in your in your. Then you have to go to a cube, basically. No, I think I don't think that there is really a so to say, a, a, a principal barrier of uh, at least I cannot I cannot think of it for any of those methods to go to three dimensions. It's just then whether you know you can converge your results uh, within uh, this this precision you can get. For example, also for FRG, right? They use some momentum uh, uh, momentum uh, grids or or some uh, uh, schemes where it expands in the momentum. Mm -hmm. And some of them will not work then anymore, uh, simply. But this is a, I would consider this as a more technical issue. On the other hand, if, uh, so to say, from the algorithm's point of view, if you take DMFT, DMFT, the approximation is much better in three dimensions because three dimensions turns out to be much closer to infinite dimensions than two. <laughs> much closer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, Roser? Yes, um, I have a question on the nickelates. So you are right. showing to us that you get a very good agreement, for instance, for um, the uniform static susceptibility, but you have these factors of 10 or factors of 3. Now, right. um, my question is, when I look at these uh, susceptibility measurements, they look rather, let's say, uh, what you would expect for these um, materials. So it's not that you say, oh, the nickelates are behaving very different to the rest of uh, materials with this time of uh, structure. So right. isn't the, the, so my question is, the fact that you are getting this behavior is because your model is rather general. So, and this is the type of behavior you are going to expect for these materials. And now yeah. it's a question of the parameters that you have there to get these factors on, um, so basically yeah. this scaling on the right uh, re region. So is it something like that? So, I, 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 that like that? Mm -hmm. so I agree with the point that the model obviously is rather general and uh, actually we compared also our curves to, to some cuprate experiments and they also, they agreed a bit better in the cuprates than in the nickelates. On the other hand, we also try to adjust our parameters because, for example, this, you know, uh, the interaction parameter, it stems from a CR CRPA calculation. And obviously this is, you know, it's a bit of sometimes a bit of voodoo, which exact uh, parameter you, you should, uh, you should then take. On the other hand, in this regime of the phase diagram, uh, it didn't change too much actually the, uh, the actual value of this susceptibility. So of the uniform susceptibility. So not a factor of three. So this, this we can ex at least exclude in the approximation which DGAMA does, obviously. This is also, this one also has to take into account. We trust on the other hand the DGAMA pretty, pretty much because, you know, it, it has the same behavior as CDMFT, which is a completely other technique and however it can go uh, to lower temperatures. So it's, I think it's the best approximation we can do at the moment in this regime. So how, how far can you go with DGAMA if I want to now to go to multi-orbital systems? I know, oh, that, oh. I know that I always put this question, but uh, of course everybody is doing development. So how is right, the development right. now? Yeah, I'm I'm not completely involved in the in the actual multi-orbital uh, thing because this is uh, there exists already a programming package which is called Abinitio Digamae. Uh, the problem there is a bit, and uh, the people uh, around Karsten in Vienna want to circumvent this a bit that. What you have to do in DGAMA is the so-called Moria correction. So you introduce some rules, a bit like in the TPSC approach, which uh, which you perfectly know. Um, and this is not completely clear 
uh, how to introduce this, for example, in a multi-orbital system. So what happens, and, and we did, actually, I did one calculation uh, in, in my time in, in Paris about strontium ruthenate, so SR2 uh, RU104. Um, for this, for the for the uh, Fermi liquid phase, and there it turns out that the DMFT, which is the starting point from the DGMA, it orders, and you cannot get rid of this ordering without the Moria correction. This is a bit of a problem, and this is not fully clear uh, uh, how how to introduce this in in a, in a true multi-orbital system, I would say. But there are some developments also with Georg in in, in Hamburg, uh, who is also going into that direction. But there, I think a bit of thought has to be uh, put in still. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, no. um, so this is more Fermatish uh, <laughs> meaning. Um, so is there a clear pathway from the real material um, to the uh, Hubbard modeling mm. um, such that say somebody has a certain material and then you do your GFT optimization and so on. And then you say, let's see if somebody has already spent the 1 million hours <laughs> to calculate the aquicorrelations for something very similar to my material. Yeah, so in principle, there exists a, a scheme, so to say, which is, which is recognized as being, a, in a certain sense, generic, but then also not really. So it's, it's the LDA plus DMFT scheme. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you do is you do your uh, DFT uh, calculation, then you, you project on the one-year states, mm -hmm. you get the one-year states, you do a CRPA, which gets you the interaction parameters. Uh, and from the one-year, you get the tight binding, and then you can go to Hubbard and DMFT. So this is, this is the usual thing. But of course, uh, the devil lies in the detail there. So how do I do the, the double counting correction? Um, how uh, how is the CRP exactly exactly done? Because you also can tweak this, but I would say this is to me at least, which you know I'm coming more from the model perspective and so and so on. But this is the perspective which I get that this is a rather generic scheme, and we discussed this also with Jose yesterday, basically for the Fermat uh, for or for the Nomad. Um, database that that this is actually also the workflow which which you're doing at the moment right yeah, yeah i'm really curious if one can set some reasonable parameters such that you say okay i have certain material and then this is our proposed mm -hmm. uh, hubbard model that mm -hmm. you could uh, use uh, but then okay more expert people will question that um more questions ah um yeah you can use this Thank you for the amazing talk. So um, when you were discussing the triangular lattice, you established this comparison between the METs and uh, the excited state. I forgot the exact, I think it was CDMFT. Uh, CDMFT. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of curious, could this be extended to a general metric? So would this type of comparison still hold when you go, when you change, for example, the, the METs ground state calculation? Um, in, in, in which sense? So did it change the model or...? or... Yeah, so, so now you, you were basically, you, you could find, this was basically the multi-messenger approach, I, I guess, that yes. you are using from both realms, then we find yes. where they have Absolutely. to, where they merge. Of course, depending on the material system that we have, some other model might be more appropriate. So is this a kind of general concept that we could yes. extend? So, so actually it turned out to be, or, or you know, it's, it's a certain perspective of how to look at things. So, um, because all of these methods, this would be way too detailed for the talk, but they have advantages and, 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 and drawbacks, obviously. And if you, if you are clever that you can take one method and mitigate the, the drawbacks of the other, uh, then, I mean, this is, this is a very nice thing because you, as I said, you have the self-correcting mechanisms in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. And here, I mean, it's really, it's really, it was astonishing also to, to us that these two completely different methods gave more or less the same result, right? I mean, obviously they are both still biased by a finite size effects, for example, like the cluster or the, uh, the tube, uh, the cylinder, but nevertheless, I mean, it, uh, uh, I mean, it gives us confidence in, in the result more than, you know, then just applying your favorite method and then publishing the stuff and say that's it. No. So. Okay. Thank you. Thanks you. Um, 
Okay, I think uh, we are basically <laughs> at, the, at the end of the hour. So uh, let's thank uh, uh, Thomas again. I don't see any. Yeah.